travel consideration happening now. The San Antonio Fire Department freeing a man trapped in a trench in northwest Bear County. We'll have the very latest next. And schools will play sports during the pandemic, but with some delays. Greg Simmons with which schools will have to go by the new UIL guidelines. Political infighting is slowing down a big relief bill for Americans. I'm Nadia Romero at the White House. I'll explain why Republicans can't seem to find a path forward. From contact tracing to vitamin therapy, scams are on the rise. Coming up, what you should watch out for. Pretty seasonable the next couple of days, but we're tracking a system moving into the Gulf of Mexico. Could bring us some good tropical moisture and maybe some much needed rain. We'll talk about it coming up. A new breakdown of pediatric COVID-19 cases in Bear County. Giving us a better idea of how kids are faring here. The news at five starts right now. About two and a half hours. That's how long a 50 year old worker was trapped in a 10 foot deep trench that he accidentally fell into on the city's northwest side. It all happened at the intersection of Galm Road and Swayback Ranch. Jaffney Gray's been there for a few hours now. We hope he's OK. Stephanie, do you have an I mean, Jaffney, do you have an update on the man's condition? Yes, guys, he was taken to the hospital. Again, the fire chief of District 7 said that it appears that he was in significant amount of pain. But again, this all this is how it all happened. The fire chief of District 7 says that it appears that the 50 year old man was walking along this trench when a side caved in, causing him to fall into the hole. And he ended up waist deep in dirt, which was an issue at the start of the rescue. But they were able to have some of that dirt removed. Take a look at your screen right now. This is the entire rescue captured on camera after hours hours of trying to get the man out of the hole safely. He was eventually rescued by a crane like system. Fire Chief Kevin Clarkson says that the main reason why it took so long was because they had to make sure no other sides to the trench would cave in like it did in the first place. So the technical rescue team used that as an anchor point to be able to uh, winch the person in a Stokes basket up out of that uh, that 10 foot deep trench and get him up on the ground safely. Uh, this this process took a long time. You, you see about two and a half hours or so. The man was eventually airlifted to the hospital. Luckily, there were physicians on scene that were able to tend to the man while he was stuck under the hot sun. Now, Clarkson says that they were able to keep the man stable, but again, when he was, after he was rescued, it seemed to be in a significant amount of pain. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. Meantime, the city is going to be getting some free help to replace the former Metro Health Director after she left the job early last month. The outside firm that helped put Don Emmerich into the job is going to be looking to fill the job again at no charge. Yesterday, Case had obtained emails that detailed the friction between Emmerich and Assistant City Manager Colleen Bridger, who used to be the Metro Health Director. Bridger is now the acting director of Metro Health again. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger sorts it all out and takes a look at the process that brought Emmerich to San Antonio and what's next. Well, because the Mercer Group, or the Mercer Group had contracted with the city, they had a 180 day clause in their contract. And so since Emmerich stepped down within that first 180 days of being on the job, they will now help find her replacement like they helped to find her. So how did Emmerich wind up in San Antonio in the first place? Now, according to the city, they worked with the Mercer Personnel Management Center to draft a brochure and begin advertising the position last year. The city was then presented with a slate of candidates in October that was whittled down to six to be interviewed. Those six spoke with two panels of city leadership and community stakeholders, but we don't know exactly who was on them. The city required us to submit a records request to see who was on those panels, and we have not received a response yet. Now, after Eric Walsh had one-on-one -on -one interviews with the top candidates, Emmerich was chosen. Now, according to the list the city provided of the five other candidates interviewed, Emmerich got the job over health officials from Laredo, Pennsylvania, Chicago, and LA. Now, it's time to start over. Though the city does not yet have a timeline for finding its new director, and the job has not been posted. Now, we also reached out to Benton County, Oregon, where Emmerich had had a similarly short tenure as the head of the health department out there. Now, however, a spokeswoman told us that Emmerich had left because of personal reasons. It was not a professional issue, and she was not forced out, the spokeswoman told us. Live downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. 
Thank you, Garrett. Now to the big story of the day. The University Interscholastic League has made the unprecedented ruling delaying the start of the high school football season in the state of Texas until September 24th. The UIL, which governs high school sports and extracurricular activities in the state, making the decision in the middle of this major coronavirus outbreak, but it doesn't affect all schools. With more, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Yeah, there are most of the schools in 4A down to 1A are not affected, most of them. In making this ruling today, the UIL says there will be a full high school football season with playoffs that usually end just before Christmas, now extended to January 2021. This affects all the major school districts in San Antonio, Northside, Northeast, San Antonio, Judson, and Southwest, just to name a few. Any teams that play in 6A or 5A cannot begin any games until September the 24th and cannot begin workouts until September the 7th after Labor Day rather than August the 3rd. But teams in the play in class 4A and below will start on time on August 27th. Now here's a look at the revised schedule according to the UIL. 4A to 1A can kick off on schedule August the 27th, September the 7th. 6A and 5A football and volleyball practice can begin September the 14th. Volleyball games can begin in 6A and 5A. 4A on down are already underway. September the 14th, 6A and 5A football games can begin or I should say at least they can start their practices December the 11th through the 12th, 6A, 5A Volleyball State Tournament. That should be September the 24th. There you go, not September the 14th. And January 2021, 6A, 5A Football Playoffs extended. We have a reaction. Well, to see the UIL's update, uh, you know, gives life to our kids uh, in the push to make sure that they're not just maintaining what they've done uh, with us in strength camp, but they're pushing towards starting a season. So it's exciting for them to see new life. There's some, some scrambling going on today, just like ourselves, you know, we had some scheduled games with some 4A teams that are not going to make now. And so there's going to be some rescheduling and everybody's going to try to get that done as soon as possible. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a great opportunity and, and every time we have an opportunity to do something, uh, that's good for the kids. And what does the executive director of the OIL have to say about today's ruling? Got that for you coming up in just a few minutes in sports. Remember, for 6A and 5A high school football, September 24th. Amazing change. Thank you, Greg. We have some new numbers coming out providing a better understanding of how COVID-19 is impacting the children of Bear County. As of July 17th, there were more than 3,000 positive cases of children younger than 18. More than half of them among children between the ages of 11 and 17. There were just over 200 babies testing positive under the age of one, and more than 680 children had COVID between six and 10 years old. That breakdown made available just today by the city of San Antonio. Prior to this, pediatric numbers were lumped into one big category of zero to 19 years old. Two people, by the way, under the age of 19 have died of COVID-19 complications in Bear County. We'll get another update tonight at roughly 613 during the news at six. The loved ones of a Bear County Sheriff's Office detention deputy saying goodbye this morning during an emotional ceremony at Community Bible Church. A 53 year old Timothy De La Fuente lost his battle with COVID-19 back in April, April 30th. He'd been a deputy for more than 27 years and was looking forward to retirement. Today, music played as a horse-drawn procession carried De La Fuente's ashes, traveled under a large American flag raised by two fire trucks. Inside the church, a band played, and his closest friends and family shared memories. My brother was a happy-go-lucky guy, full of life, enjoying his job, and proud of what he was contributing to the community. I always had a satisfying feeling knowing he was performing above and beyond what was required, willing and able to do his civic duty. Tonight at 6, Devin Clark takes us back to the church for another look at the heartfelt ceremony and the legacy the De La Fuente leaves behind. We are learning more about a man who caused a deadly motorcycle crash over the weekend in Kerr County. Immigration and Customs Enforcement says 28 year old Ivan Robles Navajas was in the country illegally. A detainer has been placed against him. Robles Navajas faces several charges in the deadly head on crash, which killed three members of the Thin Blue Line Motorcycle Club and injured nine others. New at five, a woman facing charges after San Antonio police say that she stole an ambulance truck from the Methodist Metropolitan on McCullough. Police say that San Antonio Fire Department EMS 
uh, officials left the truck running at the hospital entrance and the suspect, Ashley Moreno, jumped inside and drove off. We are working to get her mug shot. No one was in that truck, but Moreno was caught a short uh, distance away. She now faces a charge of theft. And we've got some nice scattered fair weather cumulus clouds in our sky over the Alamo City, but there are some parts of town where those have uh, developed into a few showers, especially in parts of the hill country. So we'll take a look at the radar in a moment. I want to talk about the temperatures right now. We're mostly in the 90s. Now you get closer to the Rio Grande, typically warmer locations. Del Rio, for example, 102, 94 Seguin, 92 in Bull Verde, 99 in Myco and Utopia. Now we're still tracking a system that's far to the west of us. This evening, it's not going to, or to the east of us, I should say. This evening, it's not going to affect us. A clearing sky, muggy out there, and a light southeasterly breeze. There's that system moving into the Gulf of Mexico. We'll talk about that and its rain chances for us coming right up. Thank you, Adam. President Trump signing a memo today that would not include people who are in the U.S. illegally in the count for congressional reapportionment. That's the redistribution of seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. It is determined based on census population totals. Since the census does not ask a citizenship question, it's unclear what information the president would be using to calculate this narrowed population. As Congress considers the next round of coronavirus stimulus funding, Senate Republicans in the White House are on different pages, despite being in the same party. While the GOP and the Trump administration negotiate, Democrats say they want a deal done soon. Nadia Romero has details. Our nation stands at a crucial midway point in our battle against this terrible virus. It's not just coronavirus Senate Republicans are battling, but also the White House. It's hard to negotiate when the president says one thing, Senate Republicans say another, and many of them are divided. Divided over what should and shouldn't be in the next round of COVID relief legislation. Senate Republicans are focused on three main goals. Kids, jobs, and health care. Included in the roughly $1 trillion plan is funding to safely reopen schools, tax credits and incentives to businesses, and stimulus checks to Americans. Direct payments to help American families keep driving our national comeback. One thing the majority leader didn't mention is a priority for the president. The president was very clear um, that he would like to see a payroll tax in there. But it's something many Republican senators are against. There are some differences of opinion. Uh, on the question of the payroll tax cut and whether that's the best way to go. As the Trump administration and Senate Republicans work towards a deal, Democrats wait in the wings. Let's get going. It's over 60 days since the House passed the HEROES Act, which is a strong, bold and comprehensive uh, proposal. The legislation is expected to be the second largest economic rescue package in U.S. history, second only to the first measure passed earlier this year. But before Americans receive much needed aid, Democrats, Republicans and the White House must compromise. At the White House, I'm Nadia Romero. New jobs and claims of COVID-19 remedies. Coronavirus related scams are on the rise, being cautious when it comes to your personal information, your first line of defense. But what more can you look out for? We'll explain after the break. As if the pandemic hasn't hit people hard enough, now new data from the Federal Trade Commission shows a huge spike in COVID related ripoffs and fraud. 12 your side's Marilyn Morris on types of tricks to watch out for to protect your good name and your money. As COVID-19 inundates hospitals and headlines, fraud is piling up too. Callie Davidson got a notification that a purchase was made at a nearby Target. The problem? I'm like, hmm. I'm not at Target. Identity theft is thriving, but way beyond credit cards. The FBI reports a spike in fake unemployment claims too. Unfortunately, scammers are very creative and they come up with all sorts of ways to prey on people in the middle of a pandemic. The Federal Trade Commission has some 59,000 complaints related to coronavirus or stimulus scams with losses of more than $74 million. So consumer beware, phony remedies. No cures or vaccines have been approved to treat COVID-19, but fraudsters are selling teas, oils, and intravenous vitamin therapies. 
Stimulus scams. Beware calls or emails that use the word stimulus and ask for your social security number. Shady sellers. Fake websites set up to sell high demand stuff like masks and hand sanitizer. Work from home offers. Beware paying up front for materials. Jobs should pay you. COVID contact tracing scams. They need info, but not accounts or money. And phishing scams. Be skeptical of websites that have coronavirus or COVID-19 in their domain name. People need to be very vigilant against sharing personal information if they did not initiate the contact. To protect yourself, do a simple Google search with your subject and the word complaint or scam. Bottom line, be skeptical of any email, call, or text that wants something from you. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Adam, we are looking at some uh, clouds in the sky. I'm hoping a little rain somewhere. Somewhere it is out there, especially Edwards County. That's the sweet spot right now. We have a few of those isolated showers out there at the moment. Better chance of rain as we get into the weekend. It's a lot of uncertainty with it, but there's much higher hope and better odds at least of squeezing more showers out of those clouds as we're watching the system that's moving into the Gulf of Mexico. So let's get right to it. Taking a look at our radar. Big picture doesn't show a whole lot. Now closer to Houston today, much better rainfall, one to two inches along the, the coastline there, especially the Galveston area. But you get into the hill country, Edwards County, one of the sweet spots, even starting to work their way into Valverde County, Real County, seeing a few of those little downpours. This is nice to see. Not a whole lot of people are getting it, but some folks are very fortunate right now in Edwards County. And then your typical sea breeze showers popping up, which will happen every day just about every day this time of year, trying to make their way into the Quero area, DeWitt and Carnes counties. And these are pretty short lived, decent little downpours though for a brief period of time. Otherwise, just those fair weather patchy cumulus clouds, which will be dissipating once we lose our sunset, once we lose our peak heating from the sun and it sets there. I mentioned the better rain closer to Houston. You look at the satellite and radar over the past 10, 12 hours, and they've had some much better shower activity there. That's because they just had more energy and moisture with that little disturbance that was in the atmosphere. But speaking of a area of disturbed weather, moving through the Florida Straits right now, we've got this really unorganized area of activity that's causing some showers, some thunderstorms, and this is moving westward into the Gulf, likely to head its way toward Texas in the days ahead. Now, in terms of its odds of developing into a tropical system, you know, that could have a name. It's about 40% in the next five days. That's the way it looks right now. It wouldn't surprise me if we see these odds increase here uh, by tomorrow and even thereafter. Anyway, we also have Tropical Depression 7. That's the newest system in the Atlantic, likely to become a tropical storm soon. And by Sunday, that would work its way into the Caribbean. So that's not of concern to us right now. We're focusing on that first system that's moving into the Gulf, even if it's not a tropical depression, doesn't have a name or anything. It could still bring us some decent rainfall and we've upped our rain chances just a little bit as we get into Saturday and Sunday into the more scattered category. So 40 to 50 percentile. And if things go as we hope, these numbers would continue to rise. There's just a lot of uncertainty shrouded around that system because it really hasn't developed into anything yet. 97 degrees right now, dew point is 68, so it feels like we're 102. Triple digits in Castroville at 100 degrees, along with Pleasanton, 90 in Canyon Lake, 98 Rio Medina, and 97 right now in Kerrville. You get farther southwest of town, the typically warmer spots at triple digits, but not as hot as what we had last week. Dew points are up there, 60s and 70s. So we're feeling that mugginess, and that makes it feel like we're above the century mark, pretty much everywhere with the exception of the hill country. Now, notice going forward, temperatures they do drop off a bit with those better rain chances on Saturday. That would keep us from getting too hot. So we're thinking closer to 90 then, but there's a lot of time between now and then. So 76 in the morning tomorrow, 97 again by the afternoon, an isolated shower or two, just like what you see on the radar today. A few, a few lucky spots, but for the most part, uh, generally dry until we see those better rain chances by late Friday and into the upcoming weekend. At least there is hope that we could have some good deep tropical moisture move its way into town. It's nice to have something on that map. Thank you.
from hope for rain to renewed hope that there will actually be a high school football and volleyball season. And that's the UIL's intention. They want to ensure there is a season this year. I understand why they delayed it for 5A and 6A. I think it's the right decision because those teams play in more populated areas of the state. When we come back, high school delayed. The start of the high school football, volleyball season, and for that matter, all of four, uh, fall sports. We'll have more on that when we come back. And Marco Bellinelli is ready for the restart. Coming up. As you heard at the top of our broadcast, the University of Interscholastic League has postponed the start of the high school football season. The state of Texas does September the 24th for all schools in Class 6A and 5A. The ruling delays this season for all of the major school districts in the city and the surrounding area by five weeks in the middle of the soaring coronavirus outbreak in the Lone Star State and right here in Bexar County. Class 6A and 5A schools such as Judson, Wagner, Brandeis, Brennan, Jefferson, Lanier, and Smithson Valley, just to name a few, cannot begin workouts until September the 7th, which is after Labor Day when they would normally hit the field on August the 3rd and cannot kick off games until September 24. The UIL says there will be a full season with playoffs extended to accommodate the delay until January 2021 and volleyball in 6A and 5A cannot start until September 14. But all schools in class 4A and below can begin on time August the 27th. Outstanding. What an awesome day. You know, you wake up this morning and there's a lot of uncertainties, but with the UIL announcement today and I want to give them all the credit for just being being very uh, adamant and, and, and proactive in trying to do what's best for the kids, and that's what it's all about. I'm just excited for our kids, uh, based on what the UILs put out, to have them have an opportunity to play. Yeah, that seems to be the prevailing reaction to all this. Here's what the UIL's executive director had to say. While understanding situations change and there will likely be interruptions that will require flexibility and patience, we're hopeful this plan allows students to participate in the education-based activities they love in a way that prioritizes the safety and mitigates the risk of COVID-19 spread. Spurs taking the day off before getting one more practice tomorrow before they open their three scrimmages against Milwaukee on Thursday at 2 p.m. Marco Bellinelli is finishing up his fourth season in silver and black after helping the Spurs win their last championship in 2014 after over four months off now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Does the 34-year-old shooting guard feel he's reported the 2019-2020 restart in Orlando in shape? Yeah, I think so. You know, like... Uh... I spent all the summer with my girlfriend Martina in San Antonio, and uh, uh, for me, but I think for everybody, it was a long uh, summer, still a long summer. And um, you know, I did all the voluntary workout, and uh, you know, I'm in shape, I'm good. Uh, uh, for sure, I was ready to go. You know, to have, to play basketball. You know, I miss basketball a lot. So right now, we can uh, play a little bit. We can finish the season, and I'm really happy about that. All right, good to have him back. The Spurs' first game in the battle that counts is one week from this Friday against Sacramento. More coming up at 6 o'clock. All right, thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the mid-70s for most of us, upper 70s closer to the border. And then we think we'll be a little shy of 100 again tomorrow around San Antonio. Better rain chances by this weekend. We'll see you at 6.